Well, I do like Mondays, and I'll tell you why. It's because of Mishnah Mondays, which we've uh, just restarted. Really happy to be with you all. It's a great way to start the week um, with some of this, uh, what I've been calling kind of crunchy Jewish knowledge. All right, like when we meet together if you uh, on Thursdays, if you uh, come to my Parsha class, it's like, it's it's just beautiful storytelling, mystery, philosophy. Mishnah is like, how did Judaism work back then? What what is what was what were all of the customs, the laws? How did that society function? And so it's, um, and we get philosophy and storytelling along the way. But this is the beginning of Jewish law. Um, well, the Torah is the beginning of Jewish law, but this is the beginning of a tradition of interpreting the laws of the Torah and adding to them and legislating around them and trying to figure out how uh, how first of all um, we're trying to figure out how Jews lived. Um, back then, in the time of late late antiquity, the Mishnah emerges in the beginning of the of the third century of the Common Era. Um, but they're trying to figure out, and I'm sa- I'm saying this because we took a long break. So I'm giving I gave a little introduction last time, just the, like even shorter this week. But for those of us who are just joining, what we're trying to figure out is um, what was it that the rabbis um, uh, were proposing as a, a new um, way of living after the destruction of the temple and a kind of a total reconfiguration of of Jewish um, society, Jewish practice, Jewish um, life, now that it wasn't centered around a, uh, a nation and a court and a temple and the infrastructures of a of a of a sovereign society, right? So um, this is this is the beginning of of the diasporic Judaism. This is the beginning of the Judaism of, of study and practice. Okay, so that's 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 part of what the Mishnah is. Okay, we um, picked up where we left off. We took a year off and we picked up where we left off in the middle of one of the largest um, volumes of the Mishnah, um, this, this rabbinic code. And that is, uh, we were we had finished the first order of the Mishnah, which is the agricultural laws. And then we began uh, the second order of the of the Mishnah, which is maybe the maybe the 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 most beloved order of the Mishnah, because it's the holidays, it's Moed, the the the, the various holidays and discussion of the laws of the holidays, which so, which continue to shape our Jewish lives in in such a such a deep and profound way, right? The Jewish calendar is is one of the one of the central institutions and, and rhythms and, and, and structures uh, our practice out here in the, in the world of wandering, um, so the holidays. And we'll move through slowly. We don't look at every Mishnah, but the important ones and the highlights and the fun ones, um, trying to get a sense of what's, what's in here. Um, we begin our discussion with the most important Jewish holiday, which is Shabbat. Shabbat is... It's almost not a holiday because it comes every week, and yet it is the supreme holiday. And um, not just because it is the most important, and it is mentioned in you know in the first chapter of the Torah, but also because so many of the other l- laws of the holidays we learned from Shabbat. Shabbat is sort of the the holiday paradigm. Okay, um, today uh, we are going to um, take a look at a, uh, an important principle in in the practice of Shabbat and it actually ends up being just a, a, a massively important principle in Jewish life altogether. I'm going to say it in, in Hebrew first because it's so um it's so important that even though it, it they are unfamiliar words, the phrase is sometimes for familiar to 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 folks um even who haven't studied much uh, uh rabbinic literature and the phrase is pikuach nefesh. You heard the phrase pikuach nefesh, right? Pikuach nefesh um, means um, literally like a- attending to, or um, you would translate it as saving a life. Pikuach nefesh, and the principle is pikuach nefesh doche et shabbat. Saving a life literally pushes aside, but saving a life overrides shabbat. Okay, that's the principle, and um, we're gonna we're gonna. We're going to spend some time uh, um, figuring out not just uh, how that works, but also the larger question of wait. So, what does what pushes us? How can Shabbat be pushed aside, and what what constitutes um, 
a, a permitted violation of Shabbat, because after all, Shabbat is um, both the active uh, mitzvot of making kiddush, but there aren't that many active mitzvot. A lot of what Shabbat is, is about um, uh, what we call um, negative mitzvot, not doing, right? All of the laws of not doing. And just before we closed and broke for a year, we looked at, there were 39 um, actions that we that we are prohibited to do. And the idea of pikuach nefesh is, if a life is at stake, you can do them anyway. Okay, that's the simple version. You heard of this general principle? Yeah, a lot of people have. It's 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 a it's a very um, hallmark uh, principle uh, in Jewish law because it is not just important to know it, but also because it represents something something fundamental about our religion. And I'm soon going to turn and ask you to articulate what 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 is that? What is that principle behind pikuach nefesh? But let's take a look at where it comes from. Pikuach nefesh is learned from. You might think it's just, um, as my, one of my friends and, and teachers, uh, Rabbi Bnei Lapi, would say, it's just zvara. It's just like, it's intuitive. Of course, of course, you don't die for Shabbat. But it's not so obvious, not so obvious at all. And so it is learned out of a verse. Okay, let me give you a source sheet, and then, um, and then I'm going to show you the verse. I want, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you the source for pikuach nefesh. And then I want us to talk out a little bit. Okay, so what is the principle exactly? Why is this so important to us? So let's take a look here. Um, okay, you have that all in the chat. And uh, let's take a look. It's learned from a verse in Leviticus. Ushamartem et chukotai vet mishpatai asher yaseotam ha'adam v'chai bahem. And that's that, this phrase here, v'chai bahem. Ani Hashem is important. You shall keep my laws and my rules by the pursuit of which human beings shall live. Ani Hashem, I am the eternal. Okay, so obviously in the kind of regular reading of such a verse, you would say we are to live by these customs. These will shape the order and the rhythm of our lives. But because the interpreters of the Torah, the rabbis are always wondering about the need for every single phrase. Well, of course, we're going to, if you keep them, you're going to live by them. So they, what they understand is v'chai bahem, and sh, the human being shall live by them, v'chai bahem, and the Talmud says, v'lo yamut bahem, and not die by them. Okay? Clearly, um, if the Torah says you shall live by them, it means, although it's not so clear, it's not, it's not necessarily an obvious read, but it means that in keeping my laws and rules, you should you should be able to live. No 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 observance of the religion should should force you to die. That's it. That's where it comes from. That's where it comes from. And that the interpretation of that verse. And then there is um, an explicit articulation of the principle of pikuach nefesh push, pushing aside Shabbat in particular. It's the most famous expression of uh, pikuach nefesh. And that actually is in the Mishnah as well, but we have to jump forward. It's, it strangely appears in the Mishnah for, not strangely, but you'll see how it appears um, in the Mishnah for, um, for Yom Kippur, the Mishnah called Yoma, Yom Kippur. And this is, again, this is part of why I think it's so important to study the Mishnah. It's just like, uh, the, the, it's the core, the, fir the first articulation of some of these basic principles. So the first articulation of Pikuach Nefesh Dochet Shabbat, um, saving a life override Shabbat is the following. It's, it comes up in Yom Kippur and saving a life overrides Yom Kippur as well. If someone is seized with bulmus and bulmus apparently the commentators say um, is a disease that caused unbearable hunger and impaired vision, but it's especially important that it causes unbearable hunger because it's Yom Kippur. And you're not supposed to eat on Yom Kippur, but you can feed that person on Yom Kippur if he has bulmus, and you can even feed him treif. If all that's around is, is bacon, because after all, all the, the Jewish stores are closed, feed him bacon. Now, this may sound like obvious to you now, but they needed to state it as a principle, because after all, it's Yom Kippur. It's the holiest day of the year. You might think, Yom Kippur, it's just one day a year. And if something happens, too bad. You just have to suffer through it or maybe die, but we died for God. 
That's an idea, isn't it? In some religion, died for God. But no, you should feed him and even feed him traif. All right. And then while we're discussing that, some other laws, and I included them all because uh, there's sort of a, 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 fu a fun discussion. Well, not fun, but funny, interesting. Uh, if someone was bit by a, by a mad dog, oh, see, I, I retranslated it, yeah. by a mad dog, one may not feed him from the lobe of the dog's liver. But Rabbi Matya ben Harash permits. Now, what is that about? Well, there's some, there's clearly some debate there over there's a folk tradition that if you if you take off some of the dog's liver, then you'll be cured. Hair of the dog that bit you, you know what I mean? It's like sort of the one of the original formulations of hair of the dog, that the part of the dog will cure you. But most of the rabbis are like, that's not true. <laughs> that's that's not good science. But Rabbi Matya ben Harash says, who knows if it's even possible that it might help, well, then, then you can eat that. Anything that, that any, any precaution you need to take, there's no, there's no debating, Rabbi Matya argues. Maybe this will work, maybe this won't work. Any, any um, possibility for saving a life pushes aside Yom Kippur, and then comes Shabbat while we're talking about it. Uh, this same Rabbi Matya ben Harash, he's the first really great articulator of pikuach nefesh. And remember, he's the one who's even willing to take folk remedies, anything that is, and you think about folk remedies, you might think, oh, um, you might be able to go to the hospital, but you can't do acupuncture because that's, you know, like, nope. Uh, uh, you know, lots of different theories on what heals will take them all, okay? That's sort of the, what's going on here. And now we'll see Shabbat come along. And Rabbi Matya ben Harash says, if someone suffers pain in his throat, one may place a medicine inside his mouth on Shabbat because there is uncertainty whether or not it is a life-threatening situation. And any case of uncertainty concerning a life-threatening situation overrides Shabbat. V'chol, here's the line, and it's an important one. V'chol safek nefashot Doche pushes aside at the Shabbat. Um, you might wonder, by the way, what's the problem with taking a medicine? And we're not going to get too deep into how Shabbat uh, would be violated with all these things, but cooking a medicine, doing whatever it takes to make them, crushing a medicine, right? So um, puncturing the skin. We're, like, we'll try not to get too entangled in the precise violations, but the po point is you can violate Shabbat. Okay, so now let me ask you, I, the, the principle is now clear enough, and we, I think we probably like it, we're used to it. I, I, I think of it as a noble principle within our tradition, but why? What is the principle? Life is important? Okay, but speak it out. Why can you, you might well think, look, it's Shabbat. You're supposed to rest. It's God's law, and if something happens, it happens. That's just the way it is. And you'll go to heaven or whatever it is, you know, but what's the, what can you articulate the principle for me? So Florine is going to, is going to uh, uh, lead us here. Actually, it's a, a different question, but maybe mm. it will lead to it. Where does the concept of Rodef comes from? Because we know that if the embryo is causing, possibly causing the death of the mother, it's pursuing the mother, so to speak. Then she may she may have an abortion. That's and right. Aren't these similar in the same kind of mentality? Well, that's interesting because, like the the case you're describing, whether it, it's funny because um, a, the 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 fetus is called sort of loosely a rodef, a pursuer, and therefore the fetus can be aborted in order to save the life of the mother on the principle that if a rodef, a pursuer, like a murderer is chasing someone, you can kill the murderer in self-defense. That's sort of, that's the, that's the way that law get, gets told. That's the language they use. It is obviously a related conversation in that, that the preservation of, of life is, is paramount. And in this case, the fetus is not considered a full life in the way that the mother's life is. It's also true that um, a, a murderer has forfeit or an attempted murderer has forfeited their life, but it is different than our case 
it, it's related and it and it echoes this principle of the of the of the of the, of the sacredness of of saving life but it's different because it's not it's not there's not a, re, a religious there's not a, a religious law that you would be violating in order to save that life okay so it's a, i guess the religious law of killing altogether so it is i i i totally accept that it's related but also quite distinct all right um ariella well to me it just shows in the jewish religion that the sanctity of life paramounts everything else including shabbat Okay, okay, okay. There we go. Um, the, the articulation seems th 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 that Ar that Ariel is giving giving us is that the principle here is that within the religious system, within the the values that undergird this system, the preservation of life is one of our religious values. It's life itself is paramount and sacrosanct, and so it's not that we pause the religion in order to save a life, but that that is the religion or that is that is the law because of some value that this all and that after all, Ariel is just interpreting the, the verse in Leviticus like the rabbis did, right? These laws are supposed to promote life, but it isn't just the technicality like, and so if they promote death, you can't do them. But no, that's that's the point of the whole system to promote and 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 allow for the flourishing of life. I realize we haven't said a blessing yet, and we usually say a blessing, but I'm just gonna we're gonna take a break after after we understand this principle, and then we'll head into some other applications of pushing aside Shabbat. But let's let's hear from the folks who have their hands up, Rabbi Zaki. Thank you. I was just reflecting on a Mishnah class that I studied years ago about a rabbi that was leading the congregation, but arrived late. And they wanted to know why he was late because at that time it was a he. And he actually carried wood into somebody's home to keep them warm, to keep them from dying from the cold. And Good. that makes me think about carrying the wood and it was Shabbat and it was all that. Good, good. Another application of the principle, we are told in the Talmud that you can light a fire to provide warmth and, and, and comfort to a person who is, who is ailing. The person has to be ailing in a serious way, but it isn't just, I need to take that medicine or I'm gonna die, but also whatever it takes to promote the well-being and the life of, um, of a person who is, who is really suffering a life-threatening um, Ill illness. And you can extend this principle in all kinds of ways. Right, like it ends up meaning not just that you can have the surgery, but that you can drive to the hospital, right? And a lot of our, I will say that a lot of our thinking at ICAR around um, videoing our services during uh, during the pandemic was founded on this on this understanding that if people are are need to stay at home because they are suffering from a life threatening illness, or in this case, like um, uh, a life-threatening attack to their immunity. So there's there are lots of things you can do to provide them comfort and, and sustenance. So it, it, we could have that conversation another time. How far do you go with this principle? But that's the general principle. Okay, let me take um, a couple more comments from Marianka and then Hal. Uh, hi, so uh, I think the life uh, aspect is has to do with creation. God is the creator. Uh, of life, right? So sure. to re and the other factor is that we are created in God's image. So preserving a life is preserving God's creation. In other words, good. Now, now we're now we're into to, to real theology here, and also Marianka is doing a a, a a a really good solid reading of the Torah before there's any law. There's the creation of this being, this being that is created in God's image. There's creation of all forms of being, of, of nefesh chaya, a living, a living being. That seems that's the first thing God intended. So yeah, there are laws later, but they they are they are they're they're not the the they're not the the starting place. The starting place is that life should exist and thrive. Right. Once we have laws, it's 
like those laws can't override what seems to be God's original intention, which is to bring life into the world. Hal? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so if my memory is correct, uh, I think that uh, Joe Lieberman used this principle when he was senator uh, to do government business on Shabbat because, you know, he was, uh, I guess, a practicing Orthodox Jew. And, uh, you know, he still walked to the Capitol. He lived close enough to do that. But uh, but when the situation demanded it, uh, this this principle was able to sort of allow him uh, uh, to engage. So, OK, good. Good. I didn't I didn't know that that was his reasoning, but it's a good example of the conversation I was just alluding to. How far can we take this principle? You will see as almost a standard that all the doctors will wear a, an alert like a, a beeper, a pager on Shabbat. So practice observant Jewish doctors wear a pager because should they be needed? Absolutely, they have to go and take care of someone. So now, can you extend that to a politician who is after all looking after the well-being of lives, right? So that's that's a good example of how, how of, 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 of one of the questions here, which is how far can we take this principle? Okay, but I wanna ask another question for today because after all, we're following along in the Mishnah in order. And what, I, what the other question I want to ask today, because remember we had to jump to a new a volume of Mishnah to get that principle that 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 any 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 risk of life overrides Shabbat, but in Shab in Masechet Shabbat in Tractate Shabbat itself, it doesn't. We don't get that principle yet, but we do get other examples of things that push aside Shabbat. And that's really actually going to be our focus today. So we know the principle of pikuach nefesh dochet a Shabbat, that that um, that saving a life overrides Shabbat. What else might override Shabbat? And we're going to get a few examples in our Mishnah today. Okay, so let's finally. Um, that was all a very long introduction. Um, so let's just say a blessing over our Torah study today. Baruch Okay. So uh, here now, let's let's see where um, the idea that you can break Shabbat. There's a there's a lot of discussion of well, what does it take to break Shabbat? We were looking at that last week. Is this a violation of Shabbat, or is this a violation? Can you go this far, or can you go this far within the discussion of the laws themselves? But this is different. This law is not, oh, it's okay to do this within the law, but actually it's okay to break the law for this purpose. And the first example of it is uh, quite striking and uh, maybe, maybe quite surprising. Okay. Kol kitvei ha-kodesh, all sacred writings, that's the Torah and the books of the prophets. Hmm. Um, one may rescue them from the fire on Shabbat. Whether they are read on Shabbat or not, okay. Meaning, we don't read the entire Tanakh, the entire Hebrew Bible on Shabbat. We read from the Torah, we read from the books of the prophets, and we read the Megillot sometimes. But we don't read uh, most. Like we don't read from um, the Book of Proverbs on Shabbat. We don't read from the Book of of Job on Shabbat. But the statement here is all sacred writings. One may rescue them from the fire on Shabbat, whether they are read on Shabbat or not. Okay, and then there's like um there's a there's another thought that seems related, but the Talmud is not sure exactly how because then it says even though they were written in a la another language, they require burial. Okay, um, let's let's but before we go there, let's just start with sacred writings. If there's a fire. And, in, and you're not allowed to put out a fire on Shabbat. You're not allowed to start a fire, you're not allowed to put out a Shabbat. But, um, but you need to put out the fire in order to save a safer Torah, like a, a, a book of the Torah, Torah scroll. Now we know those are expensive and valuable and sacred. I know, I know, I know it's really important, but it's not a life. It's not a life, it's Shabbat. It's, it's a disaster, but should you really be able to, to, to put out a fire in order to save a safer Torah? Why? Someone have any any sense of what? Why would we be able to save holy books on Shabbat? Yeah, Leah Matsui. It's the tree of life. 
Good. Okay, <laughs> that, that comment is quite enough. Uh, she says it all <laughs> in, in just a phrase. It, it's Chaim He. But that's a deep thing to say. The Sefer Torah, instead of saying, well, it's also really important so we can also break Shabbat for it. No, maybe it operates along the same principle. Torah is the source of life. The Torah is like a living being. We rise for the Torah. We bury the Torah when um, it becomes unusable. So it's like a life. It's like a life. Okay, that's, that's well said. And speaking of burying the Torah, there was that second phrase there, right? Even if it's not written in, um, in Hebrew, even if it's written in English, a translation, Greek, you know, Syrian, it requires burial. Now, the, the rabbis of the Talmud are not sure whether this is just another law that we're saying along the way, or whether that means that even an English Torah can be saved from a fire on Shabbat, okay? Meaning, we know that a, 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 say a Torah scroll written in Hebrew can be saved from the fire on Shabbat, and what we're saying is all sacred writings translated or original need burial, is it also true that even an, a, a, a Torah written in Greek or English can be saved from the fire on Shabbat? Now, what's at stake in that debate? What's the difference between saying, "Well, we can we can read a, we can save a, a safer Torah, but not like not a translation," and then this other opinion would suggest, "No, you could even save a translation of a Torah from the you put out a fire, you break Shabbat in order to save this French Torah, this English Torah, this Greek Torah." Is there is there anybody want to want to want to speak out? What's what what are the stakes there? What's the difference between only the Torah and Torah in translation also? The holy language. Good, right? Marianka says maybe it's about the sacred script. There's certain things that are so sacred that it's like they're like a living being. The Torah scroll with its precise and the aleph and the bet and the way that God intended that can be saved, or is it like anything that is sacred, anything that, that is Torah, anything that explains Torah, anything that goes along with Torah? And the answer is suggested by the end of the Mishnah here. Uh, they debate this in the Talmud, but look at the end of the Mishnah. One may rescue the cover for a Torah scroll together with the Torah scroll and a tefillin bag along with the tefillin, even if the tefillin bag has money inside of it money which you're not supposed to save or touch on Shabbat. So you get the sense that it's, yeah, the Torah can be saved on Shabbat. And just like anything that is, that's touched the Torah, anything that, is, that, is, that has contact with the sacred, now you can break Shabbat for that, okay? And that's Sorry. quite an extension of the principle of doche uh, at Shabbat of pushing aside the Shabbat, not just for a life and not just for a Torah. Okay, a Torah is a special thing, but just sacred objects in general, okay? What, so what let's, if, what? What about, sorry to interrupt. What about the mezuzah? Well, that's that's another debate that they have in the, um, the mezuzah would fall under the category of sacred writings, but that in the Talmud, there is some debate. And what they end up saying is that if you write out blessings, like um, like a sidur, that would not be saved, right? So it has to actually be the Torah or sacred writings, mezuzah, tefillin, those are all scroll writings. And, and, and actually it's a great question because the distinction ends up being things that are sacred script, migilot, uh, written on a scroll can be saved, even if they're in translation. But other, for, it's not just any kind of Hebrew, and it's not even anything sacred. It's specifically this this form of sacred writing. Good clarification. All right, Yonatan, what's your what's your take on all this? The translation debate and the money debate to me has a lot to do with with how the rabbis see doubt. What to do when you have doubt about saving a Torah scroll? And they're saying, don't let your doubt stop you from taking this action. Um, and I think this is really the quintessential role of treating the Torah with such reverence, uh, um, not that 
the, I don't think anybody would think the Torah is as important as a person, right? No, that's plainly untrue. But we treat it that way, I think, so that we can do this sort of kalva leap and say, if you would do this for a Torah scroll, you must also do this for a person. Good, excellent. Yonatan really brings our our, our attention um, in, in to to focus on a word we used earlier, which is safek nefashot. nefashot. The, any any life that there there's some doubt that perhaps it's in danger, that's enough. And what Yonatan is saying is, it's not just that that saving a life overrides the Torah, and then not just that uh, saving a Torah. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm getting tangled in my words. Not just that saving a life override Shabbat, and now even saving a Torah override Shabbat, but what's important what the rabbis are kind of legislating us towards is don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. If there's even a sliver of a doubt that a life is in danger, like, I don't know, maybe the dog's liver will help, give it to him right away. And similarly here, uh, Yonatan says, that's what's going on here. It's not like the bag for the Torah is so important. But you shouldn't stand there and say, well, I don't know. I mean, you could save the Torah, but can you save that? Can you save the Yad? And there's money in it. So I don't know. I don't want to touch it. Don't worry about that. Do what's important. Forget about Shabbat right now. Just do it. And so it's the, the, the principle is pikuach nefesh, but the rabbinic discussion is meant to push us away from equivocating or hesitating when a life or, a, or, a, or an Eitz Chaim, a, a tree of life, is at stake. Okay, Matt Silverstein. Um, I also think there's a little bit going on here that I I, I want to use the word magic, but I'm but I'm not fully happy with that word. That the thing is is somehow so special that and there was a lot of that with the Torah is somehow just of itself is this, and I guess maybe that's the tree of life part, but I don't mean the life part. I mean, that is a magical object and we need to treat it special. And, and maybe I'm wrong, but I'm hearing that that's as a, a separate path from save a life. Okay, that's a completely fair, we very quickly followed Leah with her suggestion that the Torah is like a living being because that resonates with our with our reverence. For it. But Matt says there's another way to read this, perfectly um, a, a, a acceptable reading, which is that, there are a number of things which override Shabbat and life, human life is surely paramount among them, but other, the, there are reasons why we might violate Shabbat and, and the, another reason might be to save a sacred object. Something that sacred, it overrides Shabbat. It, it, it pushes, pushes aside Shabbat. So now we can begin, Matt's question helps us begin to wonder as we're going to do, well, it isn't just life. What else might override Shabbat? Okay. Um, and I just, I just I have a quick question. Is the do we save the Talmud? Is that sacred writing? It's a good question. That's a good yeah. question. That's a really good question. We'll, have, we'll, we'll see as we move forward what can be saved. According to the, um, it's a really good question because according to what we've just read, you might think, no, not the Talmud because that's not, uh, the Torah, nor a translation of it, but isn't the Talmud, after all, a discussion of the Torah? Maybe this, maybe this, yeah, this YouTube class will be saved on Shabbat because it's anything that is like come into contact with with Torah has to be preserved. So that, it's a really good question that, that Matt is asking. Um, I see a new uh, hand up, Esther. Hi, nice to see you. Yeah, just. Hi, it's there's two of us. Hi, uh, both of you. <laughs> uh, Justin, like to go back to the conversation. Don't doubt. Don't wait. There's there's an interesting conversation to again with the we were talking about the medicine earlier, and there there are endless discussions about this treatment. Is this really necessary on Shabbat? Is that really necessary? This and um, I remember because my father's a physician and he dealt with this a lot. So the the bottom line always ends up being, okay, first save, and then you can deliberate afterwards about the halachic uh, implications and whether you should have done it or not. First save the person and then worry about it. So yeah. that kind of goes down the same path, but don't, don't think about it too much. Just do what feels 
like needs to be done right now. Good, good. Esther, are we going to add to that at all? No. Um, thank you for that, uh, Esther and Samuel. Samuel, thank you for that. Um, so that's good. That's a that's an important um, extension of, of of what we've been saying. Don't equivocate. Don't hesitate. And Samuel reminds us because you, it's easy to get lost in the questions of, well, was was that really necessary? What? exactly can you do here? How far can you, it, it's the very nature of Talmudic debate to start thinking, well, you could go that far, but not that far. And part of what Samuel is saying is that this is all about saying, don't get into a discussion. Don't get into a debate. Don't think twice about it. Just like in, forget for a moment. And this really is, is, is the kind of meta topic here. What does it mean to suspend your religious obligations? What does it mean to, to encounter a reality in which suddenly all of the, 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 some, the, the foundation of, of Jewish practice, this idea that you are obligated, that's, all those things are suddenly don't apply. You forget about all of those things. And that's, that's, that's an important principle for us to reflect on and to consider. This entire system operates on the notion that it's too bad if you're hungry. You can't eat kosher, non-kosher food, right? You just can't. It's too bad if you really, really want to uh, travel somewhere to wish, you know, to 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 attend a, a, a simcha, to 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 pay a visit to you, the, the, the whole thing operates on this idea that you can't simply make exceptions in your religious practice. But here you can. But here you can. And I I, I want to add. Um, I want to add an important caveat to that. There are things for which the, um, the tradition says you do not make an exception. There are three, we would call them cardinal sins. And um, it's uh, idolatry, um, sexual prohibitions, like incest, and murder, right? So if any of, if someone, for example, says like, you know, worship this God or else I'll kill you, you should die first, it's sort of like martyrdom. If someone says to you, you should, you know, sleep with your mother or else I'll kill you, that indignity, you should die first. And then in some ways, the most intuitive is if someone says kill Steve or I'll kill you. You don't kill Steve. That doesn't, that, that's not a, that's not a, a fair equation, right? So there, there, there are things, Judaism is not, is not um, so, obsessed with the preservation of life that there's nothing that you should die for but shabbat so central so in fact um the punishment for the violation of shabbat in the in the torah is death and yet you can violate it in order to save a life okay so that's that's sort of where we're at here okay um i want to push forward just a, i see a lot of hands up and that's a good sign but i want to push forward a little bit just so we have more material to consider um because there are other examples here and here comes another example that i think is related to life. And we, we said the Torah is related to life, but surely the Torah, as Yonatan said, is not a life. It's like a life, but it's a step away. Here's another kind of, not quite saving a life, but a step away from it. And um, well, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna color it. See what you think. Okay. One may rescue food for three meals. Um, you can rescue, the building is burning down. You can go in and get enough food to feed yourself for three meals. Now, why three meals? And interestingly, um, they say you can rescue food for three meals, like human food for a human and animal food for an animal. So that's already interesting. You can, you, you, your, your thought for, the, for your animals is also relevant here. You can put out the fire, you can go rescue, you can risk violating Shabbat in order to get food for three meals. Now, why three meals? How does this work? If a fire ignited on Friday night, one may rescue food for three meals. If a fire ignited in the morning, one may only rescue food for two meals. If a fire ignited in the afternoon, one may rescue food for one meal. Ah, now we understand, though now we may be troubled because now the idea is you can not just save a life, but you can save some essentials. 
but you can only save as much as you need to get through Shabbat. Now, is that a good law? Take a look at Rabbi, Rabbi Yossi softens it a little bit and says, no, you can, you can always rescue three meals, at least three meals worth you can rescue, but not more than that. You can't, in other words, you can't run into a building and just start taking all of your valuables out. And here is the other end. Here's, here's the extremist Shabbat law. You have to let your house burn down. You have to let your stuff burn down. Lest you, lest you thought that this whole, this whole rabbinic discussion was just going to be permission, 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 don't worry about it. No, this is quite extreme. You can extract as much as you need to survive for the next day, but only the next day? I mean, and what kind of law is this anyway? I, I can't eat. I, I'm, I'm not going to starve by the end of the day, right? Okay, so now what's the principle? What's the principle? We, we could save a life, we can save holy objects, and we can save enough food to take care of us and our animals for the course of this Shabbat. So are we learning something new here? What's this, what's this new principle? Okay, I see a lot of hands up. Who, uh, who wants to jump in? Give me a, a, a physical hand. Say physical hand, Mary, uh, Irene, Irene. I'll always call. Uh, I try to call on you know someone who hasn't spoken yet. So well, I finally you, got a hand icon where I can raise it after all this time. Oh goodness! So, okay, good to have you. <laughs> so um, the fire, of course, hits hit it. That's the first thing I think of when you said you can save a Torah from the from you know on Shabbat. And I'm thinking of the wildfires and how we have to grab things. And it's like, so does that mean I have to grab my, my humash before I grab, you know, anything? And then it's the food for three. Does this extend? I mean, is there a hierarchy of, this is what I've been thinking about since you first mentioned it. Why does it ever break Shabbat to save a Torah from what you carry it out of the door or you run down the street, but is there a hierarchy of things? You have to save the lives of course you take the babies out and then there's the torah and then there's the ritual objects and then there's now food for three days is there some some hierarchy of what is important to save that we think about all year especially as wildfires threaten us here i mean that's where my head went good good I irene is oh irene is asking exactly the right questions which is what 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 are what's we're being forced to, to ask what is essential and we ask this question in some theoretical what would you save from a burning building what's the one object right this is like a this is like a, 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 a often a hypothetical what is your most precious object what would you save um would you save your computer would you save your tefillin would you save pictures but now the 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 the, the 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 rabbis are asking that question and they're giving us some examples but pictures aren't on there computers not on there What's on there is obviously life, but then holy objects and enough food to survive for a day. Seems like not enough. Irene was also asking, you know, well, what, what is it really, what's the violation of Shabbat here? Again, we're just presuming that there is some violation of Shabbat that you have to, you have to put out the fire or you have to violate Shabbat in some way in order to do this, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, you're supposed to like not even touch fire on Shabbat because touching fire can be a way of, of causing it to burn further, right? Like adding um, um, air or motion to it. So just presuming that it involves a Shabbat violation, what's on that list of most essential things? And why are three meals on that list? Okay, all right, let's, let's keep thinking about this. Um, I've seen Yael's hand up for a while. Hi, Yael. I'm having a hard time with this. Mm. I've got myself muted and I'm going, what, what? Um, because if you put out the fire, which you're not allowed to do supposedly on Shabbat, you might be preserving someone's home and it might lead to their, their family's demise if you don't save the home. And also the fire will spread as we've seen in wildfires to other homes. So I would think that breaking the Shabbat at the beginning of the fire, as soon as you see it and trying to put it out, throw water on it, would be the most life-preserving thing you could do. Okay, okay, thank you, Yael. I'm so glad that, that we've arrived at this point that, that Yael has brought us to this very important question um, because 
you know, save a life for Shabbat. Everybody's on board, right? Like that sounds like a great law. We're, we're save a Torah too. Wow, impressed. So we really like our our books around here. But now this law is a little different. It's like only save as much as you need to get through. What is? I mean, I mean, let, can we just can we just eliminate danger on Shabbat? A fire starts. I'll tell you a story about this. Actually, um, I remember actually when I was, you know in my young man in my 20s and I was at a Shabbat, I was there with my brother. And uh, it was, you know, it was like a group of young people and it was like a potluck and it was a little chaotic. And the Shabbat candles like started a fire. There was suddenly like some, some, something caught on fire, like some piece of paper. And all of a sudden there was like a, like a blaze in the middle of the living room. And my brother, God bless him, just picked it up and ran to the sink and turned on the sink. And some guy, oh, I'll never forget this coming. No, 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 you're not supposed to put out a fire on Shabbat. And my brother just looked at him and was like, shut up. And then like, you know, like, just like immediately, you know, put it out. And, and you know, <laughs> like, thank God. And also like, clearly my brother was right. And yet there, like this other guy who I won't name, was trying, he was trying to latch on to something here that Yael is also struggling with, which is, is there some idea that we should just, there's a certain extent to which we should just let it burn? And is that a good law? I mean, what we were so pleased with the, with the, with the permissions, but here it seems like there are some very severe lines being drawn. So in order to address Yael's concern, let's take a look at the next Mishnah where we begin to see, so we started with saving life, hooray, and then, and then now we're, we're pulling back a little bit and creating some restrictions around violating Shabbat. Um, so let's take a look at the next Mishnah where just as quickly, uh, it seems the rabbis are stepping in with, mm, I, I don't know if I, I would call this a, lo a loophole, but we're heading in that direction. Take a look at the next Mishnah. The next Mishnah is, now you can, however, you can only rescue for three meals, but the next Mishnah says, well, you can rescue a basket full of loaves from a fire on Shabbat. So you don't have to extract the three meals from the basket. If they're all in one basket, you just take it. And even if there's food for a hundred meals in it, or a round cake of dried figs, that was like a way they stored figs. So a big bunch of figs, you don't have to take three figs, Right, you take the whole the whole cake of figs or a barrel full of wine. Okay, so now it seems like ah, okay, you could just grab stuff, and it, the idea is you're grabbing four or three meals, but you don't have to worry about separating it out. You can be more practical, and it seems you can end up taking a hundred meals worth out of stuff. That that's a that's that's a pretty a major amendment to the to the law we just read. And then take a look at this. This is like. You know, it's like, it's a time of anti-Semitism in the world. So like, I wouldn't want uh, anti-Semites to see this next law because it's so like fits into their picture of something I celebrate, which is like the the the, the workaround, the, like the crafty rabbinic mind to take a look at what they say here. Um, this is like such a good example of it. And one may say to others, come and rescue for yourselves. Meaning like everybody can take three meals. Let's all go in where everybody can. We, ha we have a rule. We can all take three meals. So everybody run in and take three meals and you end up saving the whole house. And then it says, and if they are clever, they make a calculation with him after Shabbat. This is such a great line, folks. This is like really one for the record books. But again, not, not to share with our, um, with our anti-Semitic uh, 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 friends, not friends. <laughs> um, if they are clever, they make a ca calculation after Shabbat. In other words, talk about a loophole. We can get everybody to come in and take stuff. We're really only supposed to take three meals out, but everybody can come and take stuff. And then if they're smart, they'll say, okay, I got some stuff from you. You want to like pay me a little bit and I'll give you your stuff, right? Okay. So there's like all sorts of deals happening, but all sorts of workarounds to make sure that actually everything gets out of the house. So um, here's a response to Yael's concern, like what's going on here? Could we really just allow a fire to burn, right? Like this guy that my, my brother shoved away wanted us to? Or are the rabbis pointing to the same sensitivity that Yael has? That in the end, we got to make sure like Shabbat is not something that devastates our, our, all of our, our property, our lives, right? Yael framed it in terms of, well, every, every fire is danger. 
And that's a good argument, but this is a little different. This is like, uh, well, sure, surely we can get everything out if we if we try. Okay, uh, let's let's return to see what folks are are thinking here. Payam, I mean, this is sort of the way that we're thinking about it. Weird is weird because there's a reason you don't do these things on Shabbat. So if that reason doesn't apply anymore, then shouldn't you be able to do it? I mean, there's a reason these prohibitions exist. They're not just willy-nilly prohibitions because God said so. There should be some logic behind the prohibitions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that really brings us to an important question, what Payam's asking. Payam's saying, look, let's just think about, let's just think about what, what are the values underlying this system? If one of the values is the preservation of life or property or tranquility, the whole point of this stuff is that you don't, you know, the, that you want you want to preserve life and 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 shalom and well being. So let's just ask that, like, it's not it's not so complicated, is it? It's a, in fact, in a way, the way Payam's framing it, it's like pushing aside Shabbat is not really pushing aside Shabbat. It's it's within the principles of Shabbat that one saves life. That's so let's just ask what are the underlying reasons? And I think I want to that's an that is a good point and I also want to respond by saying I think part of the dilemma here is that Shabbat we can come up with reasons for it but it's a good example of something that we're doing we're practicing we're keeping in an irrational way. In other words, it's a strange thing to not be able to do any of these things once a week, to shut down your entire life once a week. It's, it, 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 there are reasons, but they're not reasons grounded in human need. I mean, yes, we can start, well, the human need for rest, the human need, but there's something about the observance of these, of these mitzvot, Shabbat and others, that suggests that sometimes we do things even though they don't make sense. And so how far do we take that? I mean, there's a lot, there are lots of ways, you know, um, I've definitely been like, in a, a dark room on Shabbat where I forgot to turn on the light and Shabbat is setting and I'm like, and it's cold and I'm suffering a little bit because I've just, it's irrational. I'm not in, actually enjoying Shabbat. And yet there's a way in which like, oh, I can suffer through this. Like I'll live with the irrational a little bit. So I think that's the line we're playing with here is can we suspend our religious obligations, which after all, maybe don't make a lot of intuitive human sense can we suspend them for needs that do make a lot of intuitive human sense or no, are there some, because after all, I know I shouldn't kill someone, you know, to, to save my life, that makes sense. And I don't want to like sleep with my family members, but when it comes to idolatry, like if you put a gun to my head, yeah, I'd like to be able to bow down to the idol. Like I, that seems like not a, not worth sacrificing for. And yet there's some notion in Jewish law that no, you actually, you do act irrationally sometimes for the sake of some higher principle, right? So that is part of what's at stake here. Okay, um, let's see if we can take a few more thoughts. Jen? Yeah, I think I'm approaching this from like almost a photo negative perspective and that's helping me a little bit. And that is instead of looking at these things as exceptions to Shabbat, just in and of themselves, how do these things facilitate the purpose of Shabbat, right? If we say one of the things we wanna do on Shabbat we're to be in the presence of or connected to the divine, if there's something about that bringing us in alignment with the divine, we have to be alive to do it. Um, we save those things that most profoundly existentially and in a sacred way connect us to the divine like a Torah scroll. Um, mm -hmm. And God nourishes us there. That's I mean, that is one of the things that God has done in the Torah is provide us with food. These things all make sense to me, not so much as exceptions to Shabbat, but as facilitations of and even enactments of Shabbat. Good, 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 good. That was, that's great. That's a great, like Payam makes, uh, this, this, this I think bolsters Payam's point. And I had kind of pushed back on it a little bit, but Jen pushes back again and says, like, I don't need to come up with the, like the practical basic, it's like, this is part of what it means to keep Shabbat. You need to be alive to keep Shabbat. You need to eat to keep Shabbat. You need a Torah to keep Shabbat. All these things are necessary for Shabbat. It's within the logic of the system, which is part of what Payam was saying as well. But Jen, Jen says that it's, it's like, you can't contradict Shabbat in order to keep Shabbat. It's pretty straightforward, actually. Okay. 
Um, let's see. Uh, I want to show you one more thing, and we're almost out of time. So let me show you an important last. This is like a couple chapters forward. And here's an important last exception or series of exceptions, um, one of which will seem very intuitive to us and will fit right into our conversation. And the last of which, a real famous example, doesn't as much. So let's take a look. Um, here now, we're jumping forward to chapter uh, 18. And it says, One may not birth an animal, even on a festival, meaning definitely not on Shabbat and even on a festival, which is slightly lesser strict stricture, but one may assist it to give birth. Okay. So you, I'm not even, I, I, I don't, I don't know enough about like animal husbandry and all those things to know what it means that you don't go all, you don't go into the full process of delivering a calf on Shabbat. But if it's, if there's a way in which you can facilitate that process to allow the, the cow to give birth herself, you can do that, okay? Remember, we were worried about animals before, humans and animal life. So you can't go all the way for an animal, but you can help a little bit. And then, of course, one may birth a woman even on Shabbat, festival or Shabbat, for sure. You can, you can, you can not just help, but you can do the delivery and even can call a midwife for her to travel from place to place. And now we're starting to see what I was saying earlier. It's not just that you can give the medicine, you can drive to the hospital and not just the person who is in physical danger, but the support for that person. Um, for one may desecrate Shabbat for a woman giving birth. And the language here is quite strange. For her sake, you violate Shabbat. And similarly, one may tie the umbilical cord of a child born on Shabbat. You're not allowed to tie knots on Shabbat. Or even to cut the umbilical cord. Oh, this, sorry, this piece belongs up here. So all of these violations around birth, you can do. And again, good. And, and it's not so hard to see why. It's actually, we don't have time, but it's a more interesting question. Why do they need to mention this separately? Giving birth is a life-threatening situation. So that should take care of that. But maybe the answer is you might think, oh, just wait, wait, she'll live. Like if she just, we delay the labor another 24 hours. But no, 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 no. Don't do that, okay? I'm out of time, but I want to give you the last example as a way of, of leaving us with a thought to consider. Um, and the last example is a famous one because I don't think it falls into the category of, uh, uh, of pikuach nefesh, which you know, a woman giving birth so clearly does. And that is, and all the requirements of circumcision may be performed on Shabbat. Now, this is a famous law because it's, it's famous because it seems like an exception. That's not saving a life. In fact, and if anything, it, you know, it, there's a little bloodletting involved, right? So, so why can you do that? And that's sort of the question that I want to end with here, though we have hardly have time. There's a technical reason which the Talmud gives, which is that it says, Uvi Yom HaShmini. It says on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. So it's like, it's the eighth day. It has to be on the eighth. The Torah says it has to be on the eighth day. So that's all there is to it. But it isn't saving a life. It's a ritual need. And now we've, we've arrived at, at, at a question. I wish we had more time to discuss, but so far we've been looking at what kinds of dangers or needs do we have in order to just preserve the, enough life and sustenance that will keep Shabbat going? But here we've arrived at a new question, which is what religious obligations push aside other religious obligations, right? And that's a different question. That's a distinct question. Um, I'm gonna take one last um, comment. Um, uh, we're almost out of time, but I'd love to hear from Derek who I haven't heard from yet. Okay, I feel scared to be the last word, but um, uh, I'll be the. La I always, I always keep talking. Okay, okay, okay. I, I, you know, I'll bring a kind of. I'm trained in the law, though I haven't practiced law. Um, and you, it's you can't. It's the law doesn't like to make rules telling people how to break the rules. So I, you know, they, they. So I think that the the thing that's interesting here is that it's like what you said about anti-Semitism. Would you like a religion that said that that had a law that said um, yeah, it's 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 a it's a good thing on on your most holiest day to preserve all of your possessions, right? What is the affirmative of that law? Someone said negative photograph, positive photograph, because if you create a a, a positive affirmative action that you're able to take, 
that becomes a law, a principle of your religion. So you can't really have a principle of your religion that says your possessions are so important that they trump Shabbat. Mm -hmm. And so I think we actually want the opposite to be the case is that Shabbat should make us reflect on the fact that our possessions aren't important except for the Torah and our life, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's not a cruel rule. It's like your house actually doesn't matter. You know, you can build another house. Like someone once said to me when I lost a job, they said, you know, the only thing you can't get back is time, but money you can make more of, right? And so I think that's sort of the principle. You can you can build another house. But you can't build another life, right? So I, I think that that's that's what I, I was thinking. Good, good, good. Okay, good. So these are, obviously we're not gonna wrap this all up and we have to stop now, but these are a couple, Derek, Derek gives us a couple of important point counterpoint tension points to consider as we leave this conversation on the one hand you know this what we're clearly seeing here is that pragmatism and more than pragmatism but like a respect for the basic needs of of human life and society is part of the conversation here the the rabbis were not extremists to to the extent that they would not consider the sometimes need to suspend religious obligations. And so we're seeing that, we're seeing that rabbinic tendency, we're seeing that as a, as a fundamental principle within the religion. But on the other hand, there are some red lines here. And the idea is not simply, don't worry about it. If you have a, a countervailing need, you can break Shabbat. No, Shabbat is important. And it's so important that sometimes you have to you have to suffer some some inconvenience if 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 not loss, real serious loss, because it's Shabbat and there are sacrifices that that must be made. The question is, what cannot be sacrificed and what can? And we're kind of playing with that here. And I guess I'll just close by saying, and I want you thinking about well, so why circumcision? seem like surely that could be pushed off another day. And here we're entering into another conversation, as I said, which is, okay, but now we've got colliding obligations and how do we balance the two? How do we, how do we rank? We've been doing kind of ranking and prioritizing. How do we rank our, our possessions? How do we rank um, our religious obligations? How do we figure this all out? And that is, after all, the work of, uh, of, of the Mishnah and the Talmud is figuring all this out. So we've done a good job of it today. We'll do one more session on, um, on Shabbat next week, and we're going to take a look at the case of the Shabbos, the famous case of the Shabbos Goy and where that comes from. Um, so uh, take, take, uh, take, uh, come back next week, and uh, we'll try to close out our discussion of Shabbat and then move on to the other holidays. Thanks for being with me, you all. Thank nice you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.